Separate is Never Equal, a story by Duncan Tonatiu about the Mendez family and their fight to desegregate California schools. Hello, and welcome to Storytime. Today's story is Separate is Never Equal. Separate is Never Equal. It's the story of Sylvia Mendez and her family's fight for desegregation. Now, our story today is a little bit long, but it's a great story about children in grade school in California, maybe 50 or 60 years ago, and how they worked with their parents to make things better for all students and all families. Desegregation is kind of a grown-up word. To segregate means to hold things apart, but to desegregate means to bring things, and in this case, people together. And so our story about Sylvia Mendez and all of her friends and family. Sylvia had on her black shoes. They were shiny new. Her hair was perfectly parted in two long trenzas. It was her first day at the Westminster School. The halls were crowded with students. She was looking for her locker when a young white boy pointed at her and yelled, Go back to the Mexican school. You don't belong here. For the rest of the day, Sylvia did not speak or introduce herself in her classes. She kept her head down when walking in the halls. When she got home that afternoon, she told her mom, Felicitas, what had happened. I don't want to go to that school anymore. The kids are mean. There's a picture of Sylvia in the hallways that day at school. Well, what do you think her mom Felicitas said? No sabes que por eso luchamos. Don't you know that is why we fought? Three years earlier, in the summer of 1944, Sylvia and her two brothers, Jerome, or Jerome, and Gonzalo Jr., and their parents, had moved from the crowded city of Santa Ana, California, to a farm in nearby Westminster. Here's a picture of the family in their car, moving and moving to their new farm. Her father, Gonzalo Mendez, had labored for years as a field worker, picking grapes and oranges. Now he was leasing a farm. He was going to be the boss. On their new farm, they were going to grow asparagus, chilies, and tomatoes. As the summer came to an end in 1944, three years ago, and the first day of school was nearing, Aunt Soledad drove Sylvia and her brothers and their cousins, Alicia, or Alice, and Virginia, or Virginia, to the local public school on 17th Street so they could enroll. Sylvia was going to enter third grade, Gonzalo Jr. was going to enter second, and Jerome first. What a handsome building, thought Sylvia, as they pulled into the parking lot. Tall trees lined the street in front of the school. There was a playground with monkey bars and a red swing. When they walked into the school, they noticed that the hallways were spacious and clean. Here's a picture of the school on 17th Street, near where they lived. And here are the kids, so excited, on their way to school. To enroll the first day. I'm here to enroll the children in school, said Aunt Soledad when they arrived in the principal's office. The secretary gave Aunt Soledad two enrollment forms, one for Alicia and one for Virginia. But she did not give her enrollment forms for Sylvia and her two brothers. They can't attend this school, said the secretary. They must go to the Mexican school. Why do I have to go to the Mexican school, Sylvia wondered. She was not Mexican, she was American. She spoke perfect English. Her father was from Mexico, but he had become a U.S. citizen. Her mother was from Puerto Rico, which was a U.S. territory. Aunt Soledad was upset. But we all live in this part of town. Sylvia looked at her cousins. They had light skin and long auburn hair, and their last name was Vidari. Their father was Mexican, but of French descent. Then she looked at her brothers and at her own hands and bare arms. She wondered, is it because we have brown skin and thick black hair 
And her last name is Mendez? Rules are rules, said the secretary. The Mendez children have to go to the Mexican school. I will not be enrolling any of them, said Aunt Soledad. And she stormed out of the office, taking Sylvia and the other children with her. And here we can see Sylvia looking at herself and looking at her cousins, Alicia and Virginia. And of course, there's Sylvia and her skin's a little darker. When they arrived home, Aunt Soledad told Sylvia's father what had happened. Mr. Mendez told her not to worry. It had to be a mistake. He would take care of it. He was a businessman and he was used to dealing with people. The next day, Mr. Mendez met with Mr. Harris, the superintendent of the Westminster School. Mr. Mendez explained that his family had just moved to a nearby farm. The public school on 17th Street is the closest school to our house and my children should attend it. Your children have to go to the Mexican school, said Mr. Harris. But why, asked Mr. Mendez. He was not given an answer other than that is how it is done. There you can see Mr. Mendez talking to Aunt Soledad. There you see Mr. Mendez comes to the school to talk with Mr. Harris. And so, in the following days, Mr. Mendez met with Mr. Atkinson, the county superintendent, Mr. Harris's superior, and then with the school board, which oversaw all of the schools in Orange County but they all said the same thing. Your children have to go to the Mexican school. But why, Mr. Mendez kept asking. No one would give him a satisfactory answer. That fall, Sylvia and her brothers had to attend Hoover Elementary, better known as the Mexican school. It was on Olive Street in the city of Westminster. The building was a clapboard shack and the halls were not spacious or clean. A cow pasture surrounded the school. Here you can see a little picture of Hoover Elementary. It doesn't look quite as grand as the school on 17th Street. Yep. And there you can see the fences and the cows right up close to the school. The students had to eat their lunch outside and flies would land on their food, yuck. There was an electric wire that surrounded the pasture to keep the cows in. But if you touched it, you received a shock. The school did not have a playground, not even a swing. The Mendez family did not give up. Time and time again, Sylvia heard her father talk with co-workers, friends, and other parents. It's not fair that our kids have to go to an inferior school, he said. It's not only the building that's a problem, the teachers in the school don't care about our children's education. They expect them to drop out by the eighth grade. How will our children succeed and become doctors and lawyers and teachers? Mr. Mendez created a group called the Parents Association of Mexican American Children. Here you see Mr. Mendez talking with other people, with the parents, with the children. He tried to collect signatures for a petition to integrate schools, that is, desegregate them, bring people together, so that all children, regardless of their skin color or background, could have the same opportunities. But every time he asked someone to sign the petition, he would get the same answer. No queremos problemas. We don't want any problems. Many of the parents worked on farms owned by white families and they feared they would lose their jobs if they supported the petition. One day, a truck driver overheard Mr. Mendez trying to convince a worker to sign his petition. You know, said the truck driver, you could file a lawsuit. The truck driver told Mr. Mendez about a lawyer named David Marcus, who had filed a suit on behalf of people in San Bernardino, and it helped them integrate the public pools there integrate, to desegregate. Here's a picture of those, of those public swimming pools over in San Bernardino and the truck driver talking to Gonzalo Mendez. At that time, not only were schools segregated, 
but also other public places as well, such as pools, parks, and movie theaters. Some business some businesses even had signs that read, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. Well, Mr. Bendis decided right then and there to hire Mr. Marcus, the attorney, even if it meant having to spend all of his savings to do so. Next, there's that ugly sign about no dogs and no Mexicans. Oh my gosh. Over the next few months, Mr. Mendez and Mr. Marcus traveled all over Orange County looking for people who had experienced similar problems. Sylvia watched her father leave early in the morning. Sometimes she saw him come home in the evening, but often she only heard his footsteps when he got in late at night. While he was away, Sylvia's mother had to take care of the farm. Mrs. Mendez would get Sylvia and her brothers ready for school then she would go out to the fields. She started the irrigation system, drove the tractor, oversaw the workers, and solved any problems that arose. So here's Mr. Mendez talking to neighbors about the petition. And then, of course, here's Mrs. Mendez hard at work on the tractor at the farm. With the help of Mr. Marcus, the lawyer, Mr. Mendez found and talked with other families who were dealing with segregation. One of them was the Estrada family. Mr. Estrada had fought in World War II. He had uh, risked his life next to Americans of all races and backgrounds when he was in the army. But when he returned to America from the war, he found out that his children were not allowed to, to attend school with white children. Es una injusticia, said Mr. Mendez. It's an injustice. The Estrada family joined the Mendez family in their case, and so did three more families. The families were from the different school districts in Orange County. Westminster, where Sylvia lived, Garden Grove, El Modena, and Santa Ana. Mr. Marcus wanted to show that the segregation of students affected not only Sylvia and her brothers, but more than 5,000 children in the public school system all over Orange County. On March 2nd, 1945, Mr. Marcus went to the courthouse and filed the lawsuit. Here's Mr. Mendez talking with Mr. Estrada, the man who'd been in the army. And here is Mr. Marcus going to the courthouse to uh, file the official papers with the court. The trial was held at a courthouse in Los Angeles. Sylvia and her family dressed in their best clothes and sat in the courtroom to listen. The hearing lasted five days. Each day, Mr. Marcus called to the stand parents from the different districts in Orange County and the superintendent from each district too. So here we see the judge and Mr. Marcus and the witnesses. Here we see Sylvia and her friends and family watching what's going on in the courtroom. Very exciting. On the first day, Mr. Kent, the superintendent of the Garden Grove District, was questioned. He said that he sent children to the Mexican school to help them improve their English. That's a lie, thought Sylvia. Her English was as good as the English of any of the children at the Westminster School. Do you give the children any tasks? asked Mr. Marcus. Mr. Kent claimed he did. We do so by talking to them. That's another lie. Sylvia wanted to yell. No one had questioned her. They rejected her from Westminster School without asking her a thing. For what other reasons do you send children to the Mexican school? Asked Mr. Marcus. Sylvia and her family braced themselves to hear what Mr. Kent would say next. Well, for their social behavior, they need to learn cleanliness of mind, manner, and dress. They are not learning that at home. They have problems with lice, impetigo, and tuberculosis. They have generally dirty hands, face, neck, and ears. Well, the Mendez family and the others in the court stared at Mr. Kent in disbelief. What he was saying was not true, and it was degrading. How many of the 292 children at the Mexican school are inferior to whites in personal hygiene? asked Mr. Marcus. 
school, at least 75%. And in their scholastic ability, asked Mr. Marcus. 75%, said Mr. Kent. In what other respects are they inferior? Well, in their economic outlook, in their clothing, and in their ability to take part in the activities of the school. Do you believe that white students are superior to Mexicans in the respects that you have mentioned? Yes, said Mr. Kent. And is that one of the reasons they are being segregated? Asked Mr. Marcus. Yes, said Mr. Kent. Time and again, Mr. Mendez had to ask, why can't my children attend Westminster School? Mm -hmm. Now he had the answer. On the second day, Mr. Marcus called to the stand a 14-year-old student from the Mexican school in El Modena. His name, pardon me, her name was Carol Torres. She spoke perfect English. It was clear that she had not been sent to the Mexican school because she had problems speaking the language. As the defense lawyers claimed, the lawyers helping Mr. Kent and the school officials. Mr. and Mrs. Mendez were questioned on the third and fourth day, and so was Mr. Harris, the superintendent of the Westminster School. Sylvia was not called to the stand, but she was ready to testify if they asked her to. She tried looking her best every morning, and she practiced what she would answer. Okay, here we can see the different people in the courtroom, the lawyers and the judge and the parents and the children and the people who worked at the schools and ran the schools. On the fifth and final day, Mr. Marcus called to the stand two education specialists to explain why it was bad to segregate, that is, keep children apart, into different schools. Segregation tends to give an aura of inferiority. In order to have the people of the United States understand one another, it is necessary for them to live together. And the public school is the one mechanism where all the children of all the people go, said one of the experts. The judge nodded his head. He seemed to agree. Judge Paul McCormick took almost a year to give his final decision. But when he did, he ruled in favor of the Mendez family. In the ruling, he said that public education must be open to all children by unified school association, regardless of lineage. That is, they shouldn't be segregated. This meant that everyone must be allowed to attend school, no matter what his or her race or background. The Mendez victory made newspaper headlines. Look at this people everywhere reading those newspapers. Oh my gosh. Grown-ups and even young people reading the newspapers. Sylvia's family was ecstatic. They were so happy. But they did not have much time to celebrate because the school board appealed the decision. That is, they asked for judges with more authority to review the case and change the result. The case was reviewed by the Court of Appeals in San Francisco. During the appeal, the Mendez family received support from the League of United Latin American Citizens, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Japanese American Citizens League, and the American Jewish Congress, as well as some other organizations. These groups sent letters with information relevant to the case and asked the judge to rule in favor of the Mendez family. Sylvia was amazed that people of different backgrounds and from different parts of the country who had never met her family were getting involved in the case and trying to help them. But her mother said, Cuando lo causa es justo, los demás te sequen. When you fight for justice, others will follow. And here you see the children. And what is that? That's San Francisco, where the appeals court was being. On April 15th, 1947, three years after the, this story began, the judges in the Court of Appeals in San Francisco ruled in favor of the Mendez family again. That June, Governor Oral Warren 
signed the law that said all children in California were allowed to go to school together regardless of race, ethnicity, or language. Cuando la causa es justa, los demás te siguen. When you fight for justice, others will follow. So remember, said Sylvia's mother, we fought to make sure you could attend a good school and have equal opportunities. Sylvia thought long and hard about what her mother said. The next day, she returned to the Westminster School. This time, she did not listen to any whispers. She ignored the children who pointed at her and called her names. Instead, she held her head high. Her parents had fought not only for her and her brothers, but for all their classmates. Looking around, she saw that other children were smiling at her. By the end of the day, she had made a friend. And by the end of the school year, she had made many friends of different backgrounds. She knew that her family had fought for that. And here we can see the kids at school learning to get along, get along and uh, we may be different, but we're kids and we can play together and learn from each other. The end. And if you like, here's a picture of Sylvia when she was a little girl and what Sylvia looks like today as an adult woman. And there's Sylvia's parents, and there are the two schools, the uh, Westminster School on 17th Street and the more rundown and uh, the school that needed more help. That was Hoover Elementary. Thanks again for listening. Remember our book and remember the message. Separate is never equal. And bringing people together and learning from each other is the best way of the world and the best way of our country and the best way of our church. Thank you so much. Take care, be safe, and tune in for our next story. Adios. And words from our story that you might like to discuss with your friends or your parents or your brothers and sisters or your neighbors segregate to separate people based on race ethnicity class or other factors the word racism treating people of color unfairly because of their skin color or their ancestors injustice something that is not fair Desegregation, a word we already talked about. Ending segregation, ending the laws and practices that separated people by skin color and made things unequal and unfair for people of color. School segregation was a form of racism. Students were treated unequally and unfairly because of their skin colors. Many people worked together, however, to change the unfairness of segregated schools in California. Unjust and unfair situations can be changed, even today too, by people working together to make things more fair. Take care. And adios.